we're going to uh, finish out a series that we've been in for, this is our third week, called Navigating Next. Now, if you've not been here the last couple of weeks, let me share with you, we're talking about how to, how to navigate this unknown frontier called the future. Every single one of us live one moment away from unexplored territory. And the future, as we know by experience, the future can throw at us unexpected things and sometimes it even throws at us on unwanted things. So the last couple of weeks, we've just kind of been looking to Scripture to explore how do we, how do we navigate the future well and with confidence and boldness, courage, when it throws unexpected and unwanted things our way. So a couple of weeks ago, for example, we talked about the distractions that we will undoubtedly face as we step into the future, distractions that would, that would very seductively cause us to veer off course. Then last week, we talked about what do we do when the future takes us and shakes us? What do we do when we don't know what to do? Well, this week, I want to bring a conclusion to this series by talking to you about making the most out of your next moments. And I want to begin with a quote that has really challenged me personally, and uh, I share it often. I think I've shared it with you many times. It goes like this. The great tragedy of life is not that it ends so soon but that we wait so long to begin it. That's interesting. The great tragedy of life is not that it ends so soon, that we have wasted moments at the end of life. The great tragedy of life is that we have wasted moments at the beginning of life. Let me share with you a couple of observations about the, the next moments in your life that are unique from any other resource that you have or you control. The next moments of your life, you absolutely must spend on something. It's not like other resources in your life that you can save up and then spend later all at once. No. Every moment of your life, you make decisions about how am I going to spend, how am I going to invest that moment. You must spend them. If you don't use them, you lose them. And the other thing about that make the moments of your life unique is that once you make a decision, I am going to spend this next moment of my life in this way, all sales are final. You can't, you can't return an hour of your life or a day of your life for a refund. There are no do-overs in life. You don't get a mulligan, okay? You don't get a certain number of mulligans in life to be able to do it over. No, we must spend every moment that comes our way. And once we spend that moment, there are no refunds. So the great tragedy of life is that we live much of our life, most of our life, all of our life and realize that those moment by moment decisions we've made about how to invest the next moments of our life really don't pay off in the end. How do you invest the next moments of your life? Here's the, here's the thought. Here's the, the whole theme of this morning's sermon. To navigate next well in your life Make the most of every moment. Every moment that you have left in life, be sure you are making the most of every moment. Perhaps the most dramatic example of someone who realized about midway through his life that he was wasting his life and he made a U-turn change to make the most of the remaining moments of his life. Perhaps the most dramatic example of that is in the life 
of the apostle Paul. Before Paul was Paul, Paul was Saul. In fact, Paul spent about half of his life as Saul. And for about half of his life, he wasted his life spending the moments of his life on things that did not matter in eternity. In fact, it was during the first half of Paul's life or thereabouts, about the first half of his life, that Paul set out in opposition to God. He was trying to squash this brand new thing called Christianity. In fact, he would seek out Christians, those who follow Jesus, and he would have them killed in an attempt to squash this thing called Christianity. But one day, many of you know this story, one day Paul had a life-changing experience with Jesus. And from that moment on, he made the most of every single moment he had left. And this, about the second half of his life really mattered. Paul would say things like this. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which Jesus has called me heavenward. Paul said, I want to make sure I am working every moment of my life toward that end. And fortunately for us, as you might expect, he tells us how he did it. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Okay, this is a letter to a church that Paul had established in a real place called Ephesus. And he's writing to Christians there. And during the letter, he addresses how to make the most of every moment you have left. We're going to begin reading in verse 15. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 15. Paul says, Christians, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, verse 17, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to, the God, to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so Paul says several things here. He says, Christians, to make the most of every moment, first, give God your undivided attention. Did you see that in verse 17? He talks about making the most of every opportunity. And then in verse 17, he says this, understand what the Lord's will is. In other words, Christian, to make the most of life, to get the most out of life, to make the most of every moment, don't let worldly voices crowd out God's voice in your life. Let me share with you how this played out in Paul's life. After, after Paul had a life-changing encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, one of the very first things he did was get away from it all. In fact, Paul went out into the desert in Arabia for three years. Why did Paul get away from everyone and spend three years in the Arabian desert after meeting Jesus? Here's why. Because he wanted to give God his undivided attention. He wanted to know what God's will was, absent all of the other chatter going on in his culture. In fact, he wrote about it. If you want to just turn briefly over to Galatians chapter 1, I'll read you how Paul describes his encounter here. He's, he's writing to the Galatian church here, and he is affirming that what he taught them, he didn't make up, that he received it directly from God. Here's the way he put it. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from
from Jesus Christ. For you've heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how I intense, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, watch this, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. But I went into Arabia and later I returned to Damascus. See, Paul lived the remaining moments of his life absolutely convinced that what he had received from God was the truth. You know, the only way he knew that, he had carved time out to give God his undivided attention. Okay, Christians, in one way, this sounds like it would be easy for us living in 2020. Now, why do I say it should be easy? Because we have God's word to us. We have it. We have the closed canon. This is God, what God has to say about life, death, and eternity right here. You and I know what God has said. We have that in our possession. In one way, it ought to be easy for us to hear from God. We have his word. But practically, giving God our undivided attention can be tough, can it? Folks, we live in a culture that is full of very loud voices. We have the media screaming things into our life. We have social media screaming things into our life. We have academia screaming things into our life. On and on I could go. The deafening voices that vie for our attention can be overwhelming. Sometimes Trying to hear from God can, can be like sitting in the big lecture hall, you know, and the professor's down at the front. And you're trying to listen to what the expert is saying and everyone around you is talking to you, distracting you from what the expert is trying to say. Sometimes Christianity can feel that way. So here's what I want to recommend. Now, things are about to get really radical at Redeemer, okay? So y'all just hold on. I'm about to suggest something that's going to feel really, really radical to many, if not most or all of us. I'm going to recommend that every single day you carve out time to put your phone down. Put your phone down. I know. Now look, I just made a lot of people very uncomfortable. No, why do I say that? Because we have things streaming at to in a, into our lives from our screen. Sometimes we need to carve out time with the phone in the other room, with the TV turned off, where we get alone with God and just listen to what God has to say about life, death, and eternity. That's exactly what Paul did. Paul got away from the human voices so that he could hear God's voice. So give God your undivided attention so you can know what his will is through all of the chatter. Number two, Paul says, look, if you want to make the most of every moment, give God full access. Give God full access. He, he uses a picture here. He says, don't get drunk on too much wine, but be filled instead with the spirit. Okay, let's think about this picture that he uses. When someone drinks too much wine, when they are filled with wine, that person is said to be under the influence of alcohol. Why, do, why is that said? Because that person is influenced by the alcohol. That person will do things they normally wouldn't do because of the alcohol's influence on their life. They're, li they're under the influence. Okay, here's what Paul says. Don't be under the influence of alcohol. Don't be filled with too much wine. Instead, be filled 
by the Holy Spirit so that you can live under the Holy Spirit's influence in your life. Be filled with the Spirit so the Holy Spirit can, so you can do things you normally wouldn't do, but that you're doing because you're influenced by God the Holy Spirit. Now we talk about this a lot. When you accepted Jesus as your Savior, when you became a Christian, when you placed your faith in Jesus for forgiveness of sin, the Holy Spirit of God, the New Testament teaches, the Holy Spirit of God took up residence in your life. You don't get more of the Holy Spirit. You have all the Holy Spirit you will ever get, all the Holy Spirit you will ever need the moment you accepted Jesus as Savior. The Holy Spirit indwelt your life. That does not mean, however, we are always filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me give you an example. In our home, uh, in our basement, we have a room and it's where we keep all of our junk. Down in a basement, over in the corner, behind a closed door, it's where we keep all of our junk. Now, when we have guests to our home, we invite them into our home. They have full access to our living room, our kitchen, our dining room, other areas of our home, but they don't have access to that room in the basement because that's where we keep all of our junk. The stuff that doesn't belong anywhere else in the house, but that we just don't want to get rid of our junk. We don't take them down there. That's off limits to guests in our home. Sometimes that's the way we treat the Holy Spirit. We're more than happy for the Holy Spirit to come into our lives, but we don't want him to go behind that closed door. Because behind that closed door is where we keep our junk. And that room is off limits to the Holy Spirit. Paul says, don't live like that. Don't, don't, don't have any rooms in your life where the Holy Spirit, that is off limits to the Holy Spirit. Give the Holy Spirit full access to every single corner of your life because when you do, you become filled with the Holy Spirit and you live under his influence. If you want to make the most of every moment, give God the Holy Spirit full access to your life. Then thirdly, engage in Christian community. Christians, listen to me. If you want to make the most of every moment you have left, make sure you live it in Christian community. Paul says this, speaking to one another. Who are the one another's? Fellow believers. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. In fact, here's what you find. Throughout Paul's writings, there are a lot of one another's. Paul was big on Christian community and Christian fellowship. In fact, I've already mentioned how when Paul accepted Jesus, he got away, he got by himself. Here's what you find. Paul got by himself, but he didn't stay by himself. In fact, Paul spent the rest of his life engaged with and encouraging Christian fellowship. Even when he was in prison in Rome, Paul talked about how he cherished the Christian fellowship that he enjoyed with other believers. Christians, we need each other. I mean, I know we all, everybody in the room, you have, you have lessons learned from this past year and a half. We've all learned things. Let me share with you what the pandemic of 2020 reaffirmed to me. Uh, we need each other. There are, there are unmeasured costs associated with this pandemic, costs that we will never really be able to quantify fully. One of the unmeasured costs of the pandemic is the isolation that it caused. When we could not be with those we need to be with, listen, we were created 
for community. We were created to need each other. Um, now I'm thankful. I know that we're still using, uh, we're using zoom technology for those who can't be, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for being able to stream this literally all over the world, over the internet. I'm thankful for all of those things. But the last year and a half has reminded me that virtual connection is no substitute for the real thing. We need, we need each other. We need each other. It's kind of like, uh, I was so excited the other day, uh, our uh, football team announced that they're opening the stadium to full capacity for the coming football season. I think many college teams have done that. So let me ask you a question. Now, it seems like, logistically speaking, it would be easier just to do college football virtually. I mean, fans can watch college football games on television. Well, Pastor Jeff, they need the income. Well, they could sell subscriptions to television where you have to pay to watch the games from home. It's safer, it's more convenient, it's a lot less trouble just to be able to watch. So why is it that college football just doesn't go virtual? Here's why. Because virtual is no substitute for the real thing. In fact, football teams, here, watch this. Football teams play better when there are fans in the stadium. There's a word for this. They call it the 12th man. In a, on a football team, there's 12 players from each team on the field at any given time. The 12th man is the impact the fans in the stadium have uh, has on the team that's on the field. They actually play better. It's almost like they have an extra player out on the field when the fans are behind them. Christians, we need to be surrounded by fans. If we're going to make the most of the moments we have left, make sure we are taking those next steps surrounded by Christian community. Let us consider, for example, how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up, meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. One of the things that we preach regularly here, church is not an event you go to. It is a family you belong to. There is a vast difference in a church event and a church family. We are a church family because we need each other. We need to surround ourselves with Christian fans that can spur us on. Finally, Paul says, if you wanna make the most of every moment, give God thanks. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, if we're gonna make the most of every moment, it's interesting. We have to be sure we're living with a spirit of gratitude. We will live best when we live grateful. We will live best when we live grateful, church, uh, memory fades over time. And as memory fades, so can gratitude. Now, how does that work? Because as memory fades, we forget where we were. We forget where we could have been. We forget what was done on our behalf to make life the way that it is now. And when memory begins to fade and we forget those things, then we begin to take the blessings we enjoy for granted. In fact, that's what this weekend's all about, isn't it? What's Memorial Day about? Memorial Day is about, the reason we do this every single year is to remind Americans where we were, where we could have been, 
and the great sacrifice that was made so that we could have what we now have. Memorial Day is intended to keep memory from fading so that our gratitude does not wane. Paul says this, look, if you want to live well in the future, make sure you don't let your memory fade. Make sure you don't let your gratitude fade. Make sure you're giving thanks to God for everything. There was a song we used to sing. I haven't, I haven't heard in many, many years. But the song is a prayer. And the song goes like this. God, roll back the curtain of memory now and then. Show me where you brought me from and where I could have been. Remember, I'm human and humans forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Paul says to make the most of every moment we have left. Live every one of those moments with a grateful heart. You wanna navigate next well? Want to step into this frontier called the future with boldness and courage and assurance? Give God your undivided attention. Make time for him every single day of your life. Give him full access and control, not withholding any corner of your life from his presence. Travel forward with other believers, with fans, and live in constant gratitude for all God is and all God has done. The great tragedy of life is not that it ends so soon, but that we wait so long to begin it. Let me ask you a question. I wonder if there might be people here today and today would be a day of, of adjustment. God, I don't, I'm not really happy with the way I've invested some of the moments of my life. Would you help me to live the remaining moments of my life to the very best of my ability with your help? By way of invitation, let me remind you that when Paul made that decision, starting from this day forward, I'm gonna make the most of every moment, that began with an encounter with Jesus. When when Paul accepted Jesus as his Savior, the Holy Spirit of God came into his life and gave him the power, enabled him to live every moment well. Let me ask you a question. Are you living the moments of your life with the Holy Spirit of God on board? Or are you trying to do life on your own? Listen, the good news is God stands at the door of your heart and he knocks. And if you allow him to come in. He will come in and he will abide with you and the Holy Spirit of God will live inside of you. Pastor Jeff, how does that happen? God can't enter a dirty vessel. That's the bad news. And the worst news is we're all dirty vessels. We've all blown it. We've all made mistakes. None of us are perfect. The good news is that God sent his son Jesus to die on a cross to shed his blood so that our vessels can be made clean. Those who place their faith in what Jesus accomplished for us on that cross when he died to pay for our sins, our sins are washed whiter than snow, the Bible says. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus, I would like to invite you to do so right now. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes just for a moment? Nobody's, nobody's looking around. This is, a, this is a private and personal moment for everyone in the room and everyone watching. If you would like to accept Jesus into your life by placing your faith in what he did for you, your prayer to the creator might sound something like this. Dear God, I admit I'm a sinner and I am in need of your forgiveness. I believe Jesus, your son, came to this earth, died on a cross in my place to pay for my sin, and then rose from the dead. And I'm placing all my trust 
in what he did for me to wash my sins away so that you can come on board my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, well, everyone look back this way. If that was your prayer, if you prayed along with me this morning, uh, we have some helpful literature information that we would like to share with you this morning. It's a little packet of information we'll give to you so you can take it home and read through it. It's literature that explains what it means to place your faith in Jesus. What do I do next after I've prayed a prayer like that one? Well, that literature explains all of that. So please go by and receive it uh, from us at from guest services this morning. If you're watching online, uh, I would invite you to go to the website I made a decision.com. I made a decision, no spaces. I made a decision.com. Fill the form out there, and we would love to be able to mail this same literature to your home.